couple more moments. Uh, it's a great thrill and honour to have uh, Pastor Andre Olivier to minister with us today and he's brought his lovely wife Filma, uh, who's been with us before. They came 18 months ago, did a church together service for us, which was absolutely amazing. They're the senior pastors of Rivers Church in South Africa, one of the great churches not only of South Africa, but also the world. And when I heard that we had opportunity to have him come and minister for us, uh, it didn't take me very long to actually say yes. And uh, already he's been a great blessing. He preached a great message this morning, which I know will be a blessing to every single one of us right now. And my, uh, and my encouragement to everybody is just have an open heart. Uh, he's a great preacher and teacher of the Word of God. He gives you great practical tools that will help you with your life. And I just know that today the opportunity is there for your life to go to a whole new level. So could you please welcome our speaker today, Pastor Andre Olivier. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you. Wonderful privilege to be with you again, Pastor Ben and Pastor Trish at King's Church. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for the hospitality. Lovely uh, night we spent together chatting last night. Great fellowship. Isn't he a great uh, leader? State president. Hmm? Not every church has a state president. Not every church has a state president. Fantastic. Lovely couple. Been good fellowshipping with them and getting to know them. We have similar values in the kingdom and it's my honor and privilege to be here with you today. Are you receptive today? Yeah. Ready to receive? I've got a very simple message, but I think it'll be practical and helpful to you. So um, take a seat. I think it'd be good to do. And then I will get to uh, show you my family because I'm traveling with my wife, Vilma. We've been married for 51 years. And uh, last time I came, I came with my daughter who is... Uh, on the right there, on the on, on, on my left, um, on your right, and uh, and then there's my other son who lives in England and his family, and uh, he's 50 already. Can you believe it? I can't believe it went like that. You know, the other day we were we were looking after children and changing nappies, and now he's 50. So, and then I'm travelling with Carlito. He's single, and he's doing my visuals today, and um, he's available after the service to. Uh, chat, shake hands, and change phone numbers. So, are you ready to receive the word this morning? Love being in church. You love the church? You love the Lord this morning? You're going to be receptive? I'm a visitor, so be nice to me. Be friendly. Uh, in my church, they like me and they clap and they say amen. So, I expect the same here. Put your hand on your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these wonderful people, this wonderful church, and the constant growth and expansion they're experiencing. Thank you for the leadership here. I pray that you would use me today to impart grace and favor, helpful teaching, practical advice, and that you would touch hearts, that you would give us more than information today. You'd give us inspiration and that you would touch hearts. And so I pray for impartation to the heart, pray for transformation in the service, not because I'm speaking, but because you're speaking. Let your voice be heard. I pray at the close of the service, let people discover you as Lord and Savior. Let me return to you and find fresh forgiveness and renewal and restoration. We commit our time to you now. Holy Spirit, speak as only you can. Our ears are attentive. Our hearts are open. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Amen. As I open this morning, how many of you know, and this is, this is a strange statement to start with, but did you know that failure is inherent in all of us? There's no one in the room who hasn't failed or who won't fail still. In fact, if we look at the Bible from the very beginning, right from Adam, Adam and Eve failed. Then they had children, Cain failed, murdered Abel. And uh, we go on and God chooses Abraham. Abraham sleeps with Hagar. He doesn't need a second invitation and brings strife into his life. And he lies to Abimelech that his wife, Sarah, uh, is his sister. And so we see failure inherent in mankind from the very early stage. God chooses Noah and wants to start a new generation with Noah. Noah comes out the ark, plants some vineyards, and lies drunk and uncovered. And uh, we, we discover that failure is inherent in all human beings. We go to David and we see King David, a man after God's own heart, failing by taking someone else's wife and then committing murder. 
God chooses someone like Moses, a great leader, a great uh, statesman, if you like, but he's got a temper. He kills one of the Egyptians and he strikes the rock and God prevents him from going into the promised land because of his failure and his weakness. And then we think of someone like Simon Peter, the leader of the apostles, of, of the 12. Not just someone among them, but the leader. You'd expect more from a leader, wouldn't you? But he denies the Lord three times after making promises. And then you go further in the New Testament, the book of Acts, you see Barnabas, a lovely man, sold a field, and you go, wow, isn't that great, son of encouragement? And he brings the money and lays it at the apostles' feet. But in the book of Galatians, we read that he's led along by the hypocrisy of others, and he's drawn into compromise, and so there again we see failure. But how many of you know that despite failure, we can recover, and we can move forward, and God wants us to understand and recover from our failures. And so I want to speak to you today. I've entitled the message, Understanding, because you must understand how it's worked, and then recovering from our failures. And many people don't recover from failure. They live as Christians with guilt and condemnation, and they don't know how to move forward. The late pastor John uh, Wallace Hamilton said this in one of his books. He said, people are training for success when they should be training for failure. Failure is more common than success. Poverty more prevalent than wealth and disappointment more normal than arrival. Isn't that the truth? And so really we need to understand failure and know how to move on from it. Can I ask if there's anyone in the room who's never failed? Because we could just pause for a moment and let you go home or go and have a coffee while we continue with us mere mortals in the room. (laughs) Failure exists in all of us. In the book of James, it says this, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. Isn't that the truth? And so we all stumble in many ways. Paul says even when we have good intentions as Christians, we can fail and fall short. Romans chapter 7 and verse 19, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. The key thing today, if you're making notes, is this. Is, this, is the enemy is out to do two things to you with failure. He's out, number one, to defeat you, but he wants you to be defined by your failure. And you've got, to be, you've got to be sure that you don't allow him to defeat you. You need to know how to bounce back. And you also mustn't be defined by your, by your failure and take that label on yourself. C.S. Lewis in his book, Screwtape Letters, vividly describes Satan's strategy. And he says he gets Christians to become preoccupied with their failures from then on the battle is won and failure is a way of sucking the life out of you can make you depressed make you even suicidal as a Christian but we serve a God who wants us to overcome and recover from failure because his mercies are new every morning and he has grace for us to move forward Jensen Franklin, wonderful uh, preacher and communicator, I'm sure you all know. He says this, he says, the celebrity gossip industry rakes in over $3 billion a year because we live in a world that thrives off of sensational stories of failure. The enemy wants to use your mistakes to mock you, but God can use them to make you. If you let them, the people around you will define you by your failures. Don't be held hostage by your bad choices. Your failure is not final. And we thrive with failure and we love gossiping about people and the devil wants to define you by that, but God says, no, you need to understand how this is working in life, recover from it and move forward. John Maxwell says a person must be big enough to admit her or his mistakes, smart enough to profit from them and strong enough to correct them. I trust you'll be big enough today if you fail to open up and respond to God and move forward. I'm going to give you five things that we will look at today. And number three, we'll take a bit of time to unpack. But I believe these five, the number of man's weakness, six is the number of man, failure is the number of man's weakness. Uh, The layman lay under five porticos. And uh, I I want to look at this and just help you practically. Do you think that'd be good? You can make notes if you want to. And if you don't want to just go to sleep or play on your phone, whatever you want to do. Number one, admit your failure. The first thing in recovering from failure is to admit your failure. Don't deny it and don't play the victim and don't blame other people. 
People are constantly blaming other people for their failures. Even Christian leaders do this. They blame circumstances. They blame their board. They blame other people instead of saying, I did this and I'm sorry and I move forward. And you can't go anywhere unless you admit your mistakes. Proverbs 28 and verse 13 says this, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. Never. But if... He confesses and forsakes them. He gets another chance. You all know the story of the prodigal son. When he failed, abandoned his father. When he came back, what did he receive? He he received forgiveness. Isn't that true? Because he admitted, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Then he comes back, he receives forgiveness. He receives restoration and he receives blessing. Because that's what God does. Have you noticed that when people admit their mistakes, you're drawn to them rather than repelled by them? So when someone doesn't admit it, you're like, you feel like almost damn, hey. But when they admit it, grace comes from you and grace comes from God. So it's extremely important that we admit our mistakes because God responds to us and so do people. In James chapter 5, it says, admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed, restored. You may recover. So admit your failure. Number two, don't label yourself a failure. See, failure is not something that you must wear. It's something that happens to you. Something you do, not something you are. Failure is an event, not a person. It's an event, not an identity. And we can tend to make it like a label, almost like a clothing label that we wear. And we kind of call us, I'm no good. And I I never get this right. And I'm always doing that. And you've got to be careful if you label yourself a failure. Because the next step is leaving church. I don't want to keep coming here because I don't want to pretend. Can I just say you you come here and pretend because we're all on a journey. And don't misunderstand me. Don't don't don't, don't live a double life. But when we come into worship, isn't that true we pretend? Because we don't always feel like it. I don't always come into church and feel like worshiping. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm weighed down by concerns. Sometimes you've you've had an argument all the way up to the door. Mm, Husbands and wives, you argue up there, and then you walk in. (laughs) Praise God, hallelujah. (laughs) But what happens when we start singing? We bring a sacrifice of praise because we don't want to wear the label. We don't want to wear that heaviness, and so we we need to come away from that and move towards God. And uh, here's here's an important thing about labeling yourself a failure. You can end up writing off all the good that God is doing in your life. And all of us have weaknesses, but we're not all bad. Isn't that true? We have good qualities. Uh, When you think of David, King David, you don't necessarily think of his adultery. I mean, it stands out. But you think of a man after God's heart, a man who was a good king, a man who prepared the kingdom for Solomon, a man who raised up mighty men, a man who brought stability to Israel, a man who wrote all the Psalms that we enjoy. You think of him like that. And you've got to be careful that you don't look at the but in your life because sometimes your big butt is your problem. Anybody got a big butt that they keep looking at? <laughs> Let me explain before you send me out of this church. <laughs> the Bible tells me that there was a man called Naaman. And he had many fine qualities, but he had a butt. But the Bible first lists the five good qualities before it lists the butt. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but, can you see his but? He had leprosy. How many of you know we often bring our but to the front instead of, I've got this, I've got this, but I need to deal with that. And when you label yourself a failure, you're bringing your but to the beginning instead of leaving it for God to deal with, and you make it a label in your life. So easy to feel a failure, especially when other people are successful. I find that in my life I've had to watch out when I see other people, uh, God blesses them and they're fruitful, it can make me feel like I'm failing. But I've got to recognize that I'm not a failure as long as I'm fulfilling God's calling on my life and I'm walking in the path and growing with Him. Comparison is a dangerous thing. We have a race in South Africa. It's called the Comrades Marathon. It's 88 kilometers long. 
And you can imagine the person, or the, particularly the man, because there's the men's, women, uh, men's race and the women's race. Imagine the man who crosses the line. I mean, people are going crazy that this guy could run 88 kilometers and run across the line ahead of every you know, thousands of other people. But guess what? When the person who comes second comes, we don't go, boo. No, we cheer them. We cheer number three. In fact, the Comrades Marathon is interesting. When, when it gets to the cutoff point, it's 12 hours after the first person has run over the line. We cheer those people on, even though they're crawling on their hands and knees across the line. Because they are not failures because they finished. But when you label yourself, you say, well, if I wasn't in the first three, then I'm, there's no point even running. I know the Christian race is to be run. And if you can cross the line, don't label yourself a failure. Can you say Amen. The late Zig Ziglar, he is a, 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 a great motivational speaker. Many of you would know him. I've read a lot of his books over the years, and I invited him to preach at Rivers, but we got a response that he only preached in Baptist churches, so it never came about, and now he's gone to be with the Lord. But he said this. He said, the greatest joy in living lies not in never failing, but in rising every time. Sorry, you cannot climb the ladder of success dressed in the costume of failure. Don't label yourself. Number three, examine why you failed. And I talked today about understanding and overcoming failure. I want to unpack this a bit because you've got to understand why you failed. Uh, the, the author Simon Carruthers says this. He says, life is a series of outcomes. Sometimes the outcome is what you want. Great. Figure out what you did right. Sometimes the outcome is what you don't want. Figure out what you did wrong so you don't do it again. Good advice. So we should retrace our steps when we fail and ask ourselves, where did I go wrong? Why did I go wrong? And how can I fix this and move forward without this happening again? And I want to read a verse of Scripture here from 2 Kings chapter 6 to set the stage before we look at 10 places we need to retrace our steps to. 2 Kings 6, it's the story of Elisha and the school of the prophets. And, and before I read it, I want you to note that these people were not caught up in sin. They were busy expanding the kingdom. And you can fail when you're busy expanding the kingdom. You're not necessarily doing something devious. You're busy in growth. But failure can come. And it often happens to some churches when they're in a growth phase. And we'll read you. 2 Kings 6 and verse 5. It says, They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. This is for enlargement. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, not why did you lose it? He says, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. Say to your neighbor, reach out your hand. Very important. Notice Elisha didn't pick up the axe head. The man did. And I'll elaborate on that a bit later. But we see here that failure occurred even though good intentions were in operation. They were wanting to extend the kingdom and then something went wrong. And that's often how it is when the enemy gets in. But we've got to look at where it was lost. Where did it go wrong? Let's retrace our steps and I'll give you 10 places to look. And sometimes we fail, number one, because we're not gifted enough. Maybe you failed in your life because you tried to do something that you weren't gifted or graced or called for or weren't suited for. Uh, best example I can give you is how many of you have watched Idols? And people try it for Idols? And the judges say, no, you, you can't sing. You should best sing in the shower at home. And then they usually say this, I know I'm going to sing before thousands. And everyone has it. You know, we, we, we all laugh at home. It's because they don't know why they're failing. And they refuse to acknowledge that they're not gifted for it. And you can go on doing something that you're not gifted for. And all you do is you entrench failure in yourself. You can be in the wrong career. A lot of people are in the wrong career. They're in the wrong ministry in the church. If you can find where, you, where you're gifted, you won't keep failing because God's got a place for you. Isn't that true? And when you find that, you, you, you really uh, you find your niche and, and, and God can use you. Uh, someone once said this, and I think it's a good saying. They say, if you keep hitting your head against the wall, look for the door. Maybe in an area you keep failing, look for the door. Look for the avenue God is directing you to. Number two, you're not educated enough. 
That doesn't mean you didn't go to school. It just means you don't have the knowledge needed to succeed in the area that you're trying to move forward in. And sometimes when we get the right knowledge and the right input, then we can succeed. There have been times in my life where I haven't had the knowledge I needed to run the church, grow my leadership, but as soon as I had the right kind of knowledge and the right source of knowledge, then I was able to move past failure. Here's a saying, we don't know what we don't know, but when we get the knowledge, then we get the breakthrough. Number three, we're not humble enough. Sometimes we fail because we're not humble enough. We have pride, we persist in stubbornly going our own way or taking a course of action, and uh, we, we, we could be arrogant. We, we, we say we've heard from God, and so we keep going. But sometimes we need to be open. And you know, all of us have blind spots. We don't like to admit it. Do you know what a blind spot is, actually? The definition is, is it's, it's in the middle of where you're looking that you can't see. It's like a spot where you just can't see. And uh, David had a blind spot when he committed sin with Bathsheba, He couldn't see that he was wrong. In fact, Nathan came to him and said to him, uh, told him a parable about the rich man who had many lambs, but he took the poor man's lamb. And David said, he's got to die. He says, you're the man. You sometimes can't see. And every one of us needs a Nathan. Have you got a Nathan in your life who can come and tell you the truth? And you don't reject them and stop calling them and avoid them in church? Sometimes people tell us what we don't want to hear, but it's the truth for our growth. I've realized that as a leader and pastor over the years, I have to say tough things to people. And so we need to be open and we need to be humble. Proverbs 20 says, plans are established by seeking advice. So if you wage war, obtain guidance. Get some help. Number four, we're not prepared enough. Is this helping anyone this morning? We're not prepared enough. Sometimes you're not prepared for what you're doing. You you didn't bargain on what you're facing. Many people aren't well prepared for marriage because they think the feelings will carry them. And they're not prepared for the conflicts. They're not prepared for the changes that take place in their minds, in their bodies. Uh, We've been married 51 years. You can imagine how many decades that is and how many cities we've lived in and how many churches we've pastored over that period. You go through changes and a lot of people aren't prepared for that. And so they want to walk away. They want to give up. They, they, They just accept failure. No, you need to be prepared. Can I encourage you that when you make a full commitment to the Lord, you need to be prepared for the onslaught of the enemy. If you're planning to get baptized, you better better steal yourself because as soon as you get baptized and you tell the Lord, I want to give you my all and I'm dying to self, the enemy will be there to test your flesh. Bible says in Luke's gospel that as soon as Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tested or tempted by the devil. And so when you make a commitment to serve, from now on I'm going to tithe. I haven't been tithing faithfully. From now I'm going to tithe. You will be tested that month. Remember when the apostle Peter said to the Lord, Lord, everyone else will deny you, not me? He was tested. And so sometimes we're not prepared enough for what we face and then we can experience failure. Number five, you still with me? Not experienced enough. You might not be experienced enough. You haven't had enough learning in an area and growth in an area, and so you will fail. But when you get become more experienced, then you will develop and move into a strength. I was reading that in 1978 at a, a high school called Laney in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, there was a 15-year-old boy who was playing basketball, and uh, he just could not crack it. He desperately wanted to be on the team, kept missing the hoop, kept, when he dribbled, he kept stumbling with the ball. When the team was finally chosen, he, he, was, he didn't make the cut, and he felt terribly uh, discouraged by it, and everybody thought, oh, he'll probably just give up, you know, maybe he should just... But he didn't. He went alone every day to the gym where no one was playing, and he practiced three, four, five hours a day, shooting hoops and dribbling up and down. And eventually, Michael Jordan emerged, probably the most famous basketball player in the world. Why? Because he gained some experience. So failure could be a lack of experience. Are you with me? Number six. The sixth reason we can retrace our steps is maybe because we were not strong enough. You can fail when you're not strong enough. When you're emotionally or spiritually weak and you give in to temptation, you allow peer pressure to manipulate you. People can control you. Your feelings and addictions can control you. And we need to recognize that it wasn't because I was strong enough. I need to become strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And uh, if you do, you can overcome your 
failure. Number seven, not wise enough. We need wisdom. Not knowledge, wisdom. And a lot of Christians, hear me today, a lot of Christians are not wise. You know why? They don't understand this principle. They have the person of Jesus, but they don't apply the principles of Jesus. How many of you, don't put your hand up, please don't put your hand up. But how many of you know Christians who know the person of Jesus? Their prayer life is good, but they make very stupid decisions. In fact, I did a message recently, stupid things that happen to clever people. Didn't think it was a good message to preach when you're visiting. <laughs> Everyone had a good laugh. Because how many of you know, stupid things happen to clever people. Because we can have the person of Jesus, but we need the principles. And the principles give us wisdom because they come from the Word. The whole of the Bible is the Word of Jesus because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So when you have the Word of God, you grow in wisdom and there's less chance of you failing and making massive mistakes. Isn't that true? And uh, people who've got wisdom, even uh, practical wisdom, don't fail and they're successful. And sometimes we think some people are born lucky. Isn't that true? He was born clever. No, no, no one's born clever. You learn by experience and you gain wisdom. I was recently reading about a, a man and his name is Benjamin uh, Graham. And uh, Benjamin Graham uh, wrote a book called The Intelligent Investor. And in the book, he talks about all the mistakes he made in trying to invest money and how he learned from them. Well, guess what? Warren Buffett read the book and studied it. And that's why Warren Buffett is like a wonder investor because he learned from Graham how to overcome failure by gleaning his wisdom. There's no such thing as just being lucky. We need to gain wisdom. Number eight, not responsible enough. If you fail and you, because you're not responsible enough, you need to admit it. Yeah. I didn't take responsibility. Don't blame the devil when you're in debt. Yeah. Satan got into my finances. No, no, you have the code for that auto teller. You're the one who makes those transfers. You're the one who drew money and went shopping and told yourself I'm worth it when your net worth wasn't worth it. <laughs> Amen? We have to take responsibility. I did this. I didn't, I'm stupid. I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. And you take responsibility. And when we take responsibility, God honors that and he moves us forward and we can overcome. Number nine, not learned enough. Is this helping anyone? And the reason I've got so many points here because I'm sure someone can relate somewhere along the line. Here's the thing about failure. If you don't learn from it, it'll keep repeating because sometimes God keeps allowing it to happen so that you can learn. We've got to learn from our failures. Henry Ford said the only real mistake is the one from which we learn nothing. Paul writing to Timothy speaks about people in the church. He says in 2 Timothy 3, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. We shouldn't be people like that. And if we keep failing, God will keep bringing that thing to us so that we can learn. In fact, uh, G.V. Uh, Wigram is a, uh, a British Bible scholar and he said this, he said, when people fail, we are inclined to find fault with them. But if you look more closely, you will find that God has some particular truth for them to learn, which the trouble they are in is to teach them. I mean, you know, it will keep coming unless we learn. And so we have not learned enough. And number 10, here's often why we fail. We're not surrendered enough. Many Christians fail because their flesh is too alive and they haven't laid it on the altar and they haven't given their all and we still have our own agenda. And when our flesh is alive and we have our own agenda, we will constantly fail because the enemy will feed that and draw us down. Are you with me? It's so important for us to recognize that you cannot be successful and fruitful and be an overcomer unless you give your absolute all. Fritz Kreisler is a brilliant violinist, 75 years old, and he was doing a concert and a lot of university students were there, uh, third year, fourth year, fifth year, uh, violin players and really just amazed at his skill and experience. And he held this concert and then when he was finished, came off the platform and, you know, engaged certain students. And one girl ran up to him, so enamored by his skill. And she said, I'd give my life to play like you do. And he looked at her for a moment and he said, I did. I gave my life to play like this. I didn't just wake up one day and I was talented. We have to understand that failure will come if we don't surrender all 
and give our lives totally. Number four, and number four after number 10, if you're with me this morning. Don't give up because you failed. Many people give up. I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep coming to church because I keep feeling guilty and convicted. No, keep coming. Don't give up because giving up is a temporary solution or a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You can overcome. Suicide, when people feel suicidal and Christians feel suicidal, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. How many of you know many people have felt suicidal, climbed onto buildings, people spoke to them, and they were grateful that they were talked down because they went on to bounce back. And so don't take that on. Don't give up because God is still busy with you. He's going through a process with you, and you, you can end up thinking that you will feel better. Here's the thing. Often when you give up, there's a feeling of relief, but there's always regression. You never go forward. You might relieve the pressure, but you always go backwards. And we need to go on because God is busy with us and our lives are unfolding. I read a very good book recently called Late Bloomers. It's about people who are successful late in life. And I found it tremendously encouraging. People in their 50s and 60s and 70s who really cracked it. They became a major artists and successful in business and just really, and, and yet failed. Imagine if they'd given up, they wouldn't have achieved that. And we need to keep going because we can achieve success. I was reading about uh, Steven Spielberg, the great director, and how he applied to the School of uh, Arts and Drama and, and Film and Music in Los Angeles, and he was rejected three times. Can you believe it? So he just abandoned that and went and made movies and then later went back and studied because he felt he wanted that other dimension. But we all know the amazing movies he's made. Isn't that true? Got a list of them here. I wrote in my notes. E.T., Jaws, Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones, Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, and many more. They grossed 10 billion. Why? Because he didn't give up. Kept on going. Number five, put your failures behind you and move forward. Has this helped you today? See, we, we need to put our failures behind us because we're encouraged here in Proverbs 24 because some of us think that we're bad people if we fail. Proverbs 24 says, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. So that tells me good people can fail. But what do they do? They don't give up. They put them behind, their failures behind themselves and they move forward. And we need to recognize that the church is still God's plan for us. We're meant to be believers. We're meant to go on with him. And we're not meant to give up, but we're meant to press forward and trust God for a new beginning. John Maxwell says the difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. We've got to put it behind us and recognize that we can move forward and God's got new things for us and move ahead. If you look at Peter and his response to failure versus Judas, there's quite a contrast. Both of them could have been, you know, Judas could have recovered and come to Jesus and repented, but instead he committed suicide. Isn't that true? And uh, if you look at Peter versus Judas, Judas had a breakdown. Peter had a breakthrough by putting his failure behind him. Judas gave up. Peter looked up. He said, what do you mean? Well, in John 21, when Jesus made the fire, cooked the fish, he gave the bread to Peter and Peter took it with his hand. Do you remember the man with the ax head? He reached out his hand. And you can take God's forgiveness instead of rejecting it. Judas gave up, Peter looked up. Judas rejected the mercy of God. Peter accepted the mercy of God. And today I wanna to tell you the mercy of God is available to you. Judas lived in condemnation. Peter lived in celebration despite his failure, and Judas avoided public embarrassment, Peter faced up to public embarrassment. You know, when you fail, the, the enemy wants you to keep it secret and hide it, and there's power in secrecy. That's why when you put your hand up in a meeting, it breaks it. It says, no, I don't care. I want a new start. I want to be saved. Anyone failed in the meeting? Amen. You need to break that. And Peter faced up to public embarrassment. Think about this. If you had denied the Lord three times and you were the leader of the 12, wouldn't you be a bit embarrassed to kind of like appear publicly? Peter on the day of Pentecost, just 50 days later, he's speaking to thousands of people with confidence. Why? Because he made a new start. He put his failure behind him. He received the grace of God and he was able to to go on and we can do exactly the same today. And God wants to use us despite our failures. John Maxwell says this, he says, God uses people who fail because there aren't any other kind 
around. Doesn't that encourage you? Certainly encourages me. And we need to embrace, as I move to a close today, Micah, Micah's view and response to God when he failed. I love this in Micah chapter 7. He says this in his failure, Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. I reckon this needs to be our confession in failure. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. Satan, you've managed to trick me, but I'll be back. And we need to bounce back and recover and reach out to God. As I close today, let me remind you, God understands and knows that we are but dust. In fact, right from the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, he shed the blood of an animal to cover their sin and then instituted the sacrificial system. When Israel went into the land, the cities of refuge were opened up. Why? Because God knew men would fail. And then the temple of Solomon was a place they could go and confess and turn to God and ask for restitution. And then obviously the Lord Jesus came. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so there's forgiveness, there's restoration. We need to understand and recover from our failures. Before I pray with you today, I read a story about a young woman. She was in the back of her aunt's car and it happened in 2020 place called Kalamazoo County in the United States. A shooter was on the loose in the street, firing indiscriminately at people. He wounded two people and killed six people. And it was a scene of carnage, people lying on the pavement. This young girl, her name was Abigail Kopf. She was just 14 years old. She was shot in the head and her entire head was shattered. And she lay dead on the back seat of her aunt's car. The door opened, blood running. It was a terrible scene and her parents were called to come to this tragedy. And as they arrived, they recognized, yes, we as a family had made a decision. We are organ donors, all of us, including my daughter. And so the dad stood at the car on the roof, filling in the forms and signing off his daughter while her body was still warm, signing her off for organ. Imagine the, imagine the pain and the scene and the mom bent down and held onto her daughter's hand and just sat there and, you know, weeping away when suddenly the daughter squeezed her hand. Well, you can imagine, pandemonium. She jumped up, screamed, called for paramedics. They pulled her out the car, put her on to a stretcher and gave her oxygen. She began to breathe. And then they took her to hospital and they began to operate on her, put on a ventilator. And then they began to work on her and operate on her. And three years later, she has completely recovered her head has been reconstructed and she has recovered from that incident. Why? Two things. She squeezed her mother's hand. She didn't call out. She didn't jump up, help me. She just, like Peter reached out his hand, like the man who reached out and took the ax head, she, and she recovered. And here's the thing, they put on a ventilator. Do you know what the best ventilator is? It's the church. The church is that which, breathes life back into you, gets you back on your feet. And you say, well, I don't want to come here because of my failure. No, come here, you're welcome. We will breathe life back into you through the preaching, through the worship, get you back on your feet, get you serving God. But all you need to do is, I'm going to pray for you this morning, but you need to respond. And don't let the shame of your failure keep you back. Respond. Peter stood up and preached boldly. He recovered from his failure. This morning, God wants to restore you, lift you, and move you forward. If today you don't know the Lord and you're in this meeting, Jesus Christ wants you to reach out. You don't need to know the whole Bible. You don't need to know what to say. You just need to, God understands. and He will respond and begin to work in your life. Bow your head across the room with me. And I wanna take a moment to pray with you this morning. I want to pray for Christians who need to bounce back from failure. I also want to pray for people who may need to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Maybe you felt, well, you know, I don't want to become a Christian because I can't keep it up. I can't be good. I know I, I, I have many weaknesses. Well, the Lord knows that. But He wants to take you on a journey of growth. You become a Christian, you don't become instantly perfect. You go on a journey. Peter failed, but then he was restored. 
And we need to come to Christ and receive His forgiveness and grace and then go on a journey of discipleship and growth. God is there to take us forward, the Holy Spirit, and the church is there to breathe life into us as a ventilator and to bring us back and take us on to wholeness. You're here today, you say, I need to recommit my life to the Lord because I failed and I've turned away, or I need to invite Jesus into my life. I'd love to pray for you. I'm not gonna ask you to stand up. I'm not gonna call you out, but uh, maybe what you could do for me is because I wanna commit you to the Lord this morning is maybe you could just raise your hand. Say, yes, that's me today. God spoke to me. Would you would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, raise it up high. Say, yes, I need to come back to Christ. I failed and I want God to restore me. Or well, I want Jesus Christ to come into my life as Lord and Savior. In the first service, a number of people raised their hands and I prayed for them. It could be you too this, today. So just lift your hand up. Say, yes, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Let God work in you. And you know what? If you don't admit your failure, you can't move forward from it. And uh, I'm sure the people who need to respond today. Don't, don't let peer pressure people around you keep you from doing that. Just slip your hand up. See, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Many hands going up. And just, just as you got your hands up, let me pray for you. Father, thank you. People responding to you today. That hand represents a life that's turning towards you. I pray that you would put your hand upon them, Lord, that you would meet with them, that you'd restore them, that you'd give them that grace and that new beginning that they need. I thank you for their honesty. Thank you for their humility today. Pray that you would give them much grace, cause them to be established and strengthened and for them to recover. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Would you show your appreciation for Pastor Andre? What an awesome